this meeting to order. I think we do have a quorum. Can we get a roll call? Council Member Foley. Here. Council Member Perales. Here. Chair Johnny Camis. Here. Oh, quorum. All right, we actually just had a member walk in. Council uh, Member Diep. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So we'll move on to uh, no, nothing on the work plan, nothing on the consent calendar. We'll move on to reports, a uh, verbal report on economic development. Great, Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask Elizabeth Handler, who is the author of the uh, newsletter, to give the presentation. Thank you, council members. Elizabeth Handler, Public Information Manager, Office of Economic Development. We're happy to announce uh, this month um, and to amplify the report from our Small Business Ally Program that this mighty team of two has um, managed to interface with 1,100 small new businesses and actually providing hands-on support to 800 of them for fiscal year 1819, um, as well as giving numerous public presentations and participating in workshops throughout the city. It's an amazing, amazing program that we're very proud of. We also have a um, spotlight on Rockwell Automation, which has built a new demonstration center downtown. Um, and they are providing close-up looks at how um, electric vehicles are going to be um, outfitted with technologies that are being augmented by virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and pretty much portends the future of vehicles um, that we're seeing with a, a whole cluster of other businesses in San Jose. So we're very excited to have that facility downtown. And um, one of our business development officers, Vic Farley, did a Q&A with the, um, with the uh, leader of their global business in electric vehicles, and that's going to be in our blog post. We were excited to have two new Marriott properties opening up in San Jose in the Alviso area, and these are a couple of hotels that now can boast bay views, um, which is unusual for San Jose, but they look out over the San Francisco Bay from the point um, right on the corner there in Alviso looking over the bay. And one is a residence inn, and the other is um, a Fairfield. And uh, one is more um, extended stay, and the other is shorter stay. And they share some very exciting pool and fire pit and other kind of guest amenities. And we had um, another council member at the land. Yep, was at the Fairfield and residence openings, and we had council member. Perales um, inaugurating the checkmate mm -hmm. boxing with his appearance shortly after his ballet appearance in a boxing room. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> ballet, boxing, you know. Just <laughs> multifaceted <laughs> talent there. Um, the checkmate back boxing on West San Fernando is an interesting facility that has uh, the hard science of boxing with a lot of technology and a lot of kind of personal fitness and coaching elements built into it. So that should be an interesting addition to downtown. Um, south of downtown in the Almaden Shopping Center, we had the exciting um, replacement of a Starbucks with a very homegrown local business called Spectra Coffee, um, which is the, 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 the brainchild of two um, children of immigrants who um, both were in love with the, the lore and legend and excitement of coffee, and Councilmember Foley was there for the ribbon cutting for Spectra Coffee. And finally, a little guest blog post from uh, communications manager of the San Jose Downtown Association on a kind of a look at what the uh, Spartans Athletic Center is going to offer and an update of the pretty impressive fundraising that has been going on um, in order to get that facility built. And then many of you may have noticed a very stunning piece of artwork, yeah. a huge big shark fin sitting outside the SAP pavilion. It's mo the most recent um, evidence of uh, the city's partnership with Burning Man Project, the Pla uh, Playa to Paseo Project, 
So this is an artwork by Oleg Lobikin, who is um, a, local, a local artist in, in Silicon Valley, and it's his tribute to the interface of man and environment and sharks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any questions from my colleagues? Not going to show us any steps. <laughs> I I do have a one. You know, my, in my district, I know it's very south and and probably a little bit out of your way. But we had a grand opening for a, a restaurant called Sabores of the Ooh. Valley, and it's a, a breakfast place in nice. the um, Via Valente Shopping Center. That is a shopping center that is very difficult to get things going. At, unfortunately, because, uh, yeah, many things <laughs> don't do well there. And I'd appreciate it if you could Absolutely. say a few words, maybe. Absolutely. Get Send out us there. pictures and, and we'd be happy to do it. I tried their breakfast. I, I swear, you know, they had the best uh, smoked bacon. <laughs> it was really, really good. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very Great. much for the report. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're on to item number two. Uh, the semi-annual report on the Hammer Theater. Good afternoon to the committee. My name is Carrie Adams Hapner. I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs. And I'm here today with Karen Park, who's our Senior Art Program Manager who also manages the contract with SJSU to operate and maintain the Hammer Theater. I'm here with Shannon Miller, who is the Dean of Arts and Humanities at SJSU, and Chris Burrell, who is the Executive Director of the Hammer Theater Center. So we're here today to give you our, your semi-annual update on our partnership to, um, basically it's been about four and a half years uh, that we've been partnering to essentially reuse this very important cultural asset. So we're here to give you an update about how that partnership is going, what's the programming, and also um, I should acknowledge that we have Dan Keller with us today as well, who is with the Department of Public Works, who can speak to any you know, maintenance related to the facility itself. So it's been a very successful partnership, and at this time I'm actually gonna turn it over to Karen Park, who's gonna lead the presentation. Thank you. Um, the Hammer Theater Center uh, is an iconic blue building which uh, features a 525-seat theater in the downtown and the heart of the downtown. It um, was built in 1997 by the Redevelopment Agency to house the San Jose Rep. Um, but following the Rep's bankruptcy in 2014, the city undertook a year-long public process to identify a new operator to reactivate the theater. And that resulted in the selection of San Jose State at the end of 2015. Um, to support its success in this promising new venture, um, San Jose State was guided, especially in the initial years, by the Hammer Theater Advisory Group. Um, this was an advisory com committee comprised of arts and culture leaders, university faculty and administration, as well as city representatives, and that included um, Council Member Perales, um, Kerry, our Director of Cultural Affairs, and an Arts Commission representative. Um, the initial three-year operating agreement, um, it, it was extended in June of 2020, and it focuses on incubation and co-creation so that there's enough operating experience for both sides to uh, review before considering a longer-term agreement. Um, and we will be, con uh, we expect to come forward um, in spring uh, with a recommendation for a longer-term agreement. Um, so. Looking at the s indicators of success thus far, um, both city staff and San Jose State leadership are very pleased with the progress of the partnership to date. And um, as I said, we expect to bring forth a proposal for a longer term agreement in the fall or in the spring. Um, the, the hammer has become a nexus between the university and the community, um, providing a dynamic and diversified programming that reflects the unique cultural characteristics of our community. Um, this live theater has continued to be an important part of the programming, and that's what we heard from the public as we were doing our initial process, um, that that was an important feature, and the university has continued to honor this. 
um, arts and cultural groups have had, um, are accessing the venue through tiered rental rates, um, performances and activities both inside the hammer and outside on the plaza have resulted in an estimated four million in economic impact and that's through um, as people come to the downtown to spend money and employment generation. Um, the city university partnership has kept the hammer an attractive regional destination and has served as a training ground for future generations of uh, theater professionals, uh, both in front of the stage, behind stage, and arts, uh, future arts administrators. So I just, I wanna highlight the growth in audiences since the Hammer opened, as that's a key component in the sustainability. Um, the core business model of San Jose State created programming, San Jose sponsored pro state pro San Jose State sponsored programming and community rentals is proving successful in drawing audiences. Um, last year, over 57,000 people, an increase in 6% from the prior year, came to the downtown to experience almost 200 diverse and culturally engaging performances at the Hammer. And another point um, worth highlighting is the mix of theater users at the Hammer. Under San Jose State Management, the venue has become not only a jewel showcasing the best of university programming, but also a venue that arts and cultural community groups can present, to pre can present their best work. Um, so you can see um, almost 90 events, that's about 46%, that's the part in the royal blue, um, were produced by um, arts organizations such as Cinequest, Jazz, New Ballet, San Jose Youth Symphony, um, as well as community groups such as Grupo Folklorico, Los Oreles, um, Elks Lodge, Cristo Rey High School, Evergreen School of Music and Arts, uh, Ballet Folklorico, Fuego Nuevo. Um, so just a, a wide variety of community organizations have been able to um, access the theater. I um, also wanted to mention that when we presented this at the Arts Commission meeting last week, they wanted to make sure that the council knew how pleased they were that um, the number of groups um, being able to access the theater. Um, so the theater is a 20-year-old facility and has its share of repair and maintenance needs. Um, so under the current agreement, San Jose State is responsible for maintenance and repairs inside the facility. And the city is responsible for exterior maintenance and capital maintenance, uh, capital replacement of building systems. Um, so last year, the city's capital investments focused on um, replacement of the carpet um, in the auditorium and in the public spaces. So I don't know if you've been there in the last year, you'll notice the new carpet. Um, and also uh, ongoing work on the controls for the HVAC system, which is part of a larger phase project. Um, to uh, upgrade the HVAC so that the energy efficiency is improved in the building. Um, and now I would, I've talked about for the nuts and bolts, I wanna turn it over to um, Dean Miller for the highlights of programming. Thank you very much. Um, before uh, Chris steps in and talks uh, about this season and some of what we're doing uh, with our upcoming programming, I wanted to take a little bit of a look back and highlight again that range that Karen has really been um, underscoring for us. What's really been exciting about what we've done at the Hammer is to make it so that really every other, every night you can ask yourself, what's at the Hammer tonight? And it will be a different kind of thing. And that variety is really testified to here with the highlights that we have on the board. But those highlights also continue to speak to the ways in which we are engaging both uh, rental opportunities, uh, the best of San Jose State University productions, and Hammer Presents. So some real highlights this year, for example, uh, Jessica Lang Dance was an opportunity for San Jose State students to work with one of the most uh, recognized dance companies in the country um, and then have that, uh, that performance done, that uh, troupe performed twice uh, for the city. So it was a very, very exciting opportunity where we're both supporting the educational mission of our students at San Jose State and we're contributing uh, to uh, a range of programming opportunities for uh, the entire South Bay. Uh, something like Kid Koala Nephonia Must Fall is really, really innovative event in which you had a, a, a sort of beloved children's story uh, pro uh, produced for you with puppets uh, who were filmed uh, to the sound of a string quartet 
all coordinated by a DJ. So it was actually like watching a film getting made in front of you, but seeing all its component parts. This is a fascinating opportunity for our students and everything from animation to, to music to radio uh, to think about how something going on at the hammer could help them understand their own studies. But at the same time, it was just a charming, wonderful tale uh, that we showed for two nights, including um, on Valentine's Day. It's about a creator and uh, one of the uh, little computers she's created, and they fall in love. So it's the kind of programming that we just wouldn't be having if we didn't have this kind of a venue. And I also want to underscore um, some of the kinds of things that we're doing on the San Jose State side. For the second year with You're in Town the Musical, our students uh, in film and theater and in music and dance produced a spectacular musical, um, really, really extraordinarily well done and follows on the heels of last year's highly successful in the Heights and has really brought music theater back into our curriculum, but also has made it a whole nother opportunity for seeing live theater available to the community. And uh, the M Bernstein's Mass, produced by the School of Music and Dance, was a challenging, innovative uh, piece of music uh, that I got multiple people writing me about how exciting it was to have such a challenging piece presented on the Hammer stage. And I wanted to just highlight everything from the Hammer uh, Plaza Celebration in which we brought Bandaloop to <coughs> National Geographic Live. We also have a range of really exciting presentations going on, whether it be National Geographic Live, of which we're doing for a year, or a series of speakers, including Insights last year, uh, that had two, uh, let's say, warring economists talking about the state of the U.S. economy. So that just gives you a look back, but also really gives some um, specificity to this idea of what the range of things we've been doing are, is bringing to downtown San Jose and the South Bay. And from this, I'll hand it on to Chris. So uh, quality and diverse programming are really our earmarks, and Shannon spoke of what we have done. We continue to um, divide things up into logical divisions of theater, film, dance, as you can see on the slide. Uh, also trying to have a special holidays at the Hammer so that we have a good partnership with the endeavors of, of uh, Christmas in the park. Christmas in the park, am I saying that right? Um, and then our strong commitment to the community, also at the Hammer, which is where we really accommodate outside users. Uh, we helped with the uh, musical organizations that were um, that lost their home uh, by helping them as much as we can. Let's see what our next slide looks like. Um, in the theater world, we had a very successful brand uh, original production, the other Mozart. Uh, which is uh, about Mozart's sister. It was uh, nearly sold out, not quite. Uh, we <coughs> tried a little thing called uh, Little Black Dress, which was really cute, but it didn't uh, quite sell too many tickets in July. Uh, we'll try again maybe another year. Uh, and things coming up. Um, we're going to, uh, State's doing uh, the Dreamer Project, which is a really interesting and timely piece this uh, fall. In fact, they open up in three weeks, I believe. And, uh, and other programs, we'll try the next slide. Uh, in film, we continue to support CineQuest and their um, endeavors uh, and happy to do so. Uh, we're having Sundance Film Institute from Park City, Utah back doing uh, master classes, which is open to the community, by the way, as well as state. And um, the National Theater Live programs. Um, in fact, you'll see Fleabag right there because that happens to be a very popular uh, series right now on, uh, what, what is it, Netflix, or I don't know who's doing it, but it all started as a play on, uh, in uh, London, and they captured it in high definition. So that is tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, if any of you aren't doing anything. Uh, the, the tickets are affordable. Uh, in the world of dance, uh, Momix, um, we continue to work a uh, new ballet uh, partnership with them. They're now doing all four of their programs at the Hammer. Um, and the Ballet Folklorico uh, in January. Uh, the last time we, we did, uh, well, believe it or not, there's two Ballet Folklorico national companies in Mexico, and this is the second one. The first one that we did sold out before we even started advertising. So we added a second performance, um, so we'll do two of this one as well. And music, uh, Kingdom Choir, um, we, we, 
<clears throat> going to the lower right hand side, the Black Cab Jazz Series is exciting because we're doing that together with San Jose Jazz in a, in a uh, cabaret uh, setting in our black box, used to be the rehearsal room. Uh, and we sold out Kendrick Scott, the o opening program, and uh, the second program is Quiana Linnell. Um, Storm Large um, is an artist uh, used to perform with Pink Martini. Um, and we just, uh, just this weekend, we did Kaleidoscope, uh, the annual university's music and dance um, extravaganza, where there's literally every, every student performs something in that. And uh, our lecture series, which uh, uh, Shannon touched upon, but we're really trying to touch upon current subjects, um, the, the sensitive national agenda of, you know, what, of borders and, um, and how to keep people out and all that kind of uh, very poignant um, subject. Uh, and then we continue with National Geographic Live, which is a really, I mean, it's a very first rate presentation and we do four of those a year. And then here are some of the folks that uh, are at the Hammer through some, uh, through rentals through them. Oh, and the holidays, of course. So, um, you know, Nutcracker will be back with the new ballet. They have sold out every year. So if any of you have children or you like the Nutcracker, you should try to get your ticket soon. Uh, cool Yule and Mariachi Christmas is new to us. Uh, so this is a very fun Christmas program. Many theaters across the country has made this an annual program. So we'll see how it does. Uh, this is the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend. So if you're all stuffed with turkey and sick of your friends, I encourage you to come by, a, or, or family, I mean, uh, well, or friends. Um, I encourage you to buy tickets to that. Thank you. Well, thank you for the report. I have um, <coughs> Council Member Foley that wants to ask some questions. How exciting to see the Hammer Theater so utilized in the past few years. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to see all the variety of performances that you have, both children's performances as well as uh, sophisticated dance and uh, thought-provoking uh, shows and entertainment as well. So I have a question for you regarding specifically the, the community-based organizations who rent your facilities. Do you rent it to them at a discount? What kind of, what kind of uh, opportunities do they have to rent through you? Well, I, so Karen mentioned th there's a <coughs> tiered um, rental uh, structure, uh, one for people that are not nonprofit or, or are not community-based, which we call market rate. Then there's a nonprofit rate. And so we're able to s charge half the rent uh, that we would normally charge to a uh, commercial entity for our, uh, our emerging arts groups. So a, a community-based organization that is a nonprofit, do they get a discount on mm -hmm. their yes. uses? Okay. Did you say 50% off yeah, the normal it's, it's rate? Yeah, it's half the price, yeah. Okay. The distinction would be if Apple wants to rent it for an event or if somebody who's a, a corporation wants to have it for an event, those are the market style rates. Mm -hmm. But when it's a nonprofit, it moves into this other tier. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that because there's a huge need for theaters, for performance spaces, for nonprofit groups to get a space that they can have access to a green room, a decent sized stage, and a place for the adults or kids to perform. So I appreciate that. And right. all of it ha comes with a cost. So thank you. Uh, yeah, and I also wanted to mention that um, since the university has managed the venue, um, the former rehearsal facility on the fourth floor is now opened up as another per black box performance venue, so which has um, made it accessible as well for community groups that don't need a 500 seat venue, but maybe might need you know 100 seats. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. That was it. Not to mention the balcony is a pretty cool place to have an yes. event. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for all the work that you do. And um, with that being said, um, can we get a motion? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Wonderful. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. On to our uh, verbal report on citywide planning activities. Hello, 
Council Committee. I'm Michael Brio, Deputy Director with uh, Citywide Planning, and joining me is Jared Hart, Division, My Division Manager with Citywide Planning. And we'll just wait for the presentation to come up. Actually, while it's coming up, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll kind of start while he's bringing it up. <clears throat> I think, let me just tell you a little bit about what kind of the goal or what is citywide planning, because even though we've been doing this work for a long, long time, citywide planning is a more recent term that we've adopted. But the citywide planning team, which I'll talk to you about today, is really the team responsible for creating, updating, and maintaining the policy or an ordinance framework to implement our city's uh, general plans, vision, and major strategy. Oh, I do? Okay, so as I was saying that the citywide planning team is really, is the team that develops, maintains um, the policy framework and ordinance framework to implement the city's general plan. We, our particular focus, of course, is on <coughs> uh, ordinances and policies as they relate to land use and development. So our teams responsibly include the uh, Envision San Jose general plan, zoning and, and sign ordinance, council policies as they relate to land use and development, urban village planning, Planning for the integration of land use and transportation investments, including BART phase two, development and demographic data analysis, and the development of, of, uh, of land use and development policies to further the city's climate smart goals and environmental sustainability goals. So I'm not gonna get into uh, all of our work program. It's pretty extensive. But I just wanna sort of highlight some of the major things that our team is um, undertaking. Um, this includes five council priorities. This ranges from uh, uh, priorities related to the preservation of mobile home parks and, uh, and the creation of, of ordinances to facilitate electronic billboards and downtown signage. We have a supporting role on three council priorities, for example, related to cannabis and, and land use policies related to cannabis. Most of the um, housing crisis work program falls in our wheelhouse, so we're undertaking much of that work. I think th another uh, aspect of our team is that we, uh, we actually uh, process or manage the uh, entitlements for extremely low income affordable housing. This is a result of a grant that we received from Destination Home. We're also overseeing the Deridon Station Area Plan Amendment to reflect the change context in the Deridon Station Area. And we are managing four urban village planning processes, including the Barry S. of Art urban village planning process, Stevens Creek, Southwest Expressway, Ray, Ray Street, and Alum Rock East. Some of the, the big items that we're um, undertaking, of course, this year is the four-year re review of the general plan. I'll get into that a little more in a moment. And then we always do, every year, we do the annual review of the general plan, and that's where we, um, we process uh, privately initiated general plan amendments. We provide the council with a report on how we are doing to achieve, to move the city towards achieving our, uh, our goals in the general plan. <clears throat> a big item that we've undertaken, initiated very recently, is, is the effort to align our zoning with the general plan, both the zoning ordinance as well as the zoning uh, districts of individual properties to ensure that they align with the general, their general plan land use designation. Um, we also have uh, received an American Cities Climate Challenge Grant uh, to implement to further our climate goals. Those include the REACH Code, which the council recently approved, and, and also strategies to reduce parking, which I'll talk about in a, little, in a moment. Another work item is we're working with uh, Council District 7 and, and 8 on the Monterey Corridor Task Force process to improve the Monterey Corridor. And then <clears throat> a big work item that's kind of landed on us is, is to amend ordinance and permit process consistent with state law. This is something that we do regularly, but it's a heavier lift this, this time, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I think the, the good news is, is that um, we have significant staffing resources. So if you go back to 2003, we had 20, 
citywide staff members. Uh, in 2012, after completion of the Envision San Jose General Plan, we went down to four staff. As of just a year ago, we had nine staff. So thankfully, the council has approved the citywide planning permit fee in June of 2018. And today, we have 20 citywide staff positions. So that's taking us back to where we were in 2003. Of those 20 positions, 15 are currently filled. And we anticipate filling another two, two or three of them this, this fall, actually in the coming month. So here's kind of what visually the team looks like. As you can see, I'm the, the deputy director of the whole team. Jared Hart's a division manager. The team's broken into seven groups. We have a housing team that's focused on um, implementing the housing crisis work program, extremely low income housing entitlements, and tracking state legislation related to housing. We have a station area planning effort that's primarily focused on work related to BART phase two. We have our general plan team our ordinance team, our citywide planning team, which is in the near term will be the team that's focused on uh, rezoning properties to be consistent with the general plan with an initial focus on rezoning housing properties or land that's planned for housing. We have our urban village team and we have our climate, climate smart team as well. So the, the four year review of the general plan, this is something that the council has talked about recently. This is really just a reminder of the scope. The two items to highlight, of course, are revisiting the future of both North and Mid Coyote Valley, really in the context of Measure T. The other sort of uh, major item to highlight is our opportunity housing, which is looking at opportunities for duplexes, triplexes, maybe even fourplexes in areas that are currently designated for single family homes, areas that are adjacent to our transit urban villages and other um, areas that have high density housing. So our 40, as you probably have seen, the, the, the mayor sent out a memo. We have a 42 member task force that's been established that will be chaired by uh, Dave Council, former council member David Pandori and Teresa Alvarado from Spur. Our first task force meeting is on November 20th this fall, and our final and sixth meeting will include in April of 2020. Um, at that final meeting, the task force will develop a recommendation for city council. We'll do environmental review over the summer, and we anticipate that council will consider the task force recommendations in the fall of next year. So aligning zoning with general plan, this is a multi-phase effort. The first phase was doing a comprehensive update of our zoning code related to the, um, the, the allowed uses and permit requirements. This was approved by council in June of, of 2019, earlier this year. Phase 1B, as we're calling it, is updating the development standards of our existing zoning districts and creating new residential zoning districts. Many, in many cases, we don't have a zoning district that actually aligns and allows the density um, allowed within the general plan. So there's a need to really, again, align the districts to create ones that really are, are going to implement the land use designations in our general plan. That will be coming to the council in spring of 2020. And then phase, do, phase two is really the effort um, to rezone property, create one, one color on the map. We're, we're going to be commencing that early in 2020. Um, and we're going to begin focusing on housing sites um, largely because um, there's a new uh, RENA cycle where we have to update our housing element. RENA stands for Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Um, we have three years to do that, but it's going to be a very heavy lift given all the law changes related to housing elements. And so um, we're going to need to start that immediately next year to start rezoning, rezoning sites for housing. So aligning code with the state law, there's a number of things we need to do. Um, to align our, our existing code with state law, um, including some relatively minor updates to our density bonus ordinance, um, creating a ministerial approval process for SP35, which is for streamlining for affordable projects and AB2162, which is streamlining for um, homeless supportive housing. Um, the state, of course, has even liberal, liberalized uh, regulations related to ADUs even farther than we have, even though we're probably one of the most progressive in the state on this. So um, we have to update our regulations to allow what are called junior accessory dwelling units, allow larger ADUs, get rid of minimum lot size for ADUs, get rid of replacement parking for garage conversions for ADUs, and allow ADUs in multifamily buildings. 
Um, and then we're also evaluating policy and ordinance changes required by two, actually a number of state laws, including AB 3194 and SB 330. AB 3194, we talked about that um, a couple, I think about two, three weeks ago, briefly. Dave Sykes brought that up at council. There's an info memo going out on that. It may have come out today. If it hasn't come out today, it's coming out in the next day or two that you will receive with more detail on that. I think in the big scheme of things, there's a pr roughly about 30-ish state laws that have been passed in the, in the last two years, by, signed by Governor Jerry Brown and Governor Newsom. They have significant changes for the implications for the city in terms of how we process permits, uh, changes potentially to our, our general plan, our existing policies, and our uh, urban village plans are really, um, are now digging into that to get our head around all of the work that needs to be done to bring the city into conformance with state law. We'll be releasing a council memo that, that talks about all of these comprehensively and what they mean for the city in January 2020 and anticipate having a council discussion on that in February 2020 where we can dig in and not just AB 3194 as we were directed, but all of these state laws comprehensively. So um, regarding the urban village framework, this is one we're very much aware of and, and will be in a council member that if you have not received, you will receive soon. But essentially our urban village framework that was approved in 2018 in May has been invalidated by two state laws. One is AB 3194 and the other is SB 1333. So where we are right now is really looking at sort of a urban village amenity framework 2.0. Um, we are already been directed by council to create um, a commercial and mixed use urban village zoning districts. And so our approach at this time is, is proposing to embed amenity requirements within the urban village zoning districts. Um, the amenities that we, we anticipate we can include are popos, which are privately owned, publicly accessible open spaces, um, as well as art, streetscape improvements, et cetera. So it's going to be probably a more limited palette or, um, of things that we can include, but we are exploring like that. <clears throat> the other sort of uh, work item we want to highlight today is our park, is park, development of parking reduction strategies. So the purpose of, of looking at our, of, of reducing or developing parking reduction strategies is to further um, implement our climate smart San Jose goals. This work is funded by the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant, as was the REACH code. And quite simply put, um, parking often induces driving. Driving um, leads to vehicle miles traveled, which in turn leads to greenhouse gases, which in turn uh, contributes to climate change. So we're really taking a bold approach here and kind of laying everything out on the table for consideration, including eliminating parking requirements citywide or potentially just uh, or reducing them um, citywide, but also with a focus on our growth areas. Um, we are also looking at um, parking maximums. Is that something that would work in San Jose given the context of our market in San Jose? It may or may not, but we are gonna explore that. And the work's really divided into two, oh, I should say, add, um, so we're also looking at transportation demand requirements. So we have them now. If you want to get to a reduced parking, you need to provide TDMs. But trying to understand how that fits into the context of our parking strategies. For example, if you want to get to no parking, um, could you do that? You may be able to do that, but you may need to do additional transportation demand management um, things to ensure that you're not in do, uh, creating a demand for parking that people can get to your uh, use in other ways. The work's generally divided into two, um, two geographic areas. The first is downtown, and then the, the second is citywide outside of downtown. So we're initiating public uh, engagement this November. Our engagement is, is an alliance, with, uh, a partnership with SPUR, who's gonna work with us downtown, and Greenbelt Alliance is working with us citywide. And the parking code amendments for downtown are planned to come into council in the spring of 2020. And we'll, we'll be bringing back our proposed um, parking strategies citywide to council in the fall of 2020. So the other item we wanna highlight is, um, is a priority development area application. So we actually, as, as you may recall, there are things called PDAs or priority development areas. They're in the MTC, ABEX, Plan, one, plan, one, plan Bay Area. 
They're intended to be areas where the city and the region plans for both housing and jobs growth. Um, and so we have a number of, of PDAs in our cities and now, including North San Jose and downtown, and many of our urban villages, particularly those that are on really uh, high quality transit. Um, one of the villages that is not currently PDA, but we've gotten direction to council to, to explore doing urban village planning in this area is the De Anza um, <coughs> Urban Village in Council District 1 in West San Jose. So we submitted an application to MTC to add De Anza Boulevard as an urban, as a priority development area it's this past September. Uh, we'll be bringing a resolution to council um, in, in December of this year, a uh, resolution to, to, that it, we, to consider adoption of this uh, village as a PDA. What this will do is make this um, priority development area eligible for PDA planning grants. And our MTC's PDA planning grants are our primary source of funding to do urban village planning work. And incidentally, the next PDA grant cycle will be in the fall of next year. So that's at which point we would apply for grant funding to do urban village planning in this urban village as well as potentially others. And that concludes staff's presentation on citywide planning activities and we'll open up to questions. All right, well thank you very much for your presentation. I uh, appreciate the, um, <laughs> the complexity of some of the stuff that you have to continually deal with, with state legislation keeping keeping you on your toes, I guess, huh? Um, I had a question about this, and you may have answered it long ago, but I wanted to bring it back up again because we're experiencing something um, like, you know, zoning. Like right now, the, 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 um, the general plan has uh, a school in my district zoned as uh, public, quasi-public. But the actual zoning in the plan is farmland because it hasn't been changed for 50 years. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you said that you have to do these things, you have to, I guess, uh, zone things to meet the general plan a little bit at a time. Why can't we just do one memo and say the entire zoning is going to match. Well, I, th I think a lot of it has to do with, with um, outreach. So we have about 30,000 properties that we estimate are not consistent with the general plan. So um, what, what prevent, wh wh why is there a, okay, we're, we're doing a four years of outreach mm -hmm. for the general plan. Why is that not considered outreach? Well, I, I, so typically when we do rezonings of private property, we have, um, we do noticing, particularly to the property owner whose property we are proposing to rezone. Mm -hmm. We do outreach to the surrounding residents. Um, and so there's an engagement process. We have a community meeting process for that. So people are aware of what we're proposing. I mean, we are definitely game for looking at ways of streamlining this. We've been talking about the attorney's office, if there's ways to to streamline it from a legal perspective. So we are definitely exploring that, but usually as part of our approach to and community engagement, uh, which is one of our general plan major strategies is we, we definitely um, do outreach to let folks know of what we're proposing to do. So, so for me, it's like, it's like this. It's like pulling off a Band-Aid on your hairy arm one <laughs> bit at a time rather than just going and getting it done. Uh, I would rather see us work on, you know, like areas all at once and just getting it done? Is that, is that a possibility? Yeah, so we, we are not proposing to go literally one property at a time until we get to 30,000. We are gonna be doing these in tranches and chunks and, and, and putting them together. So it will be a community meeting. It could be a community meeting for 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 properties. So we're not, we would not do it one property at a time. It okay. would take forever. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. So we'll take that as a message is to continue to yeah, look I mean, at ways to streamline and speed it up and we will do that. And I give you the, the example that I have in my own district. The school's been in existence for like 30 years. They're remodeling a building and now we have, and now the communities has a say so. <laughs> I mean, it, it, they're going from uh, what do they call those portables to a solid contiguous structure. 
So there's no actually additional, there's no additional children being added to the mm -hmm. school, there's no additional usages being added to the school, but now I still, I have a huge headache because, you know, and right. because of the zoning. Right. And um, I, I just would rather see this all get done in, in larger chunks rather than everybody having to go through and get everything rezoned once a year in November for, for many of these cases, right? A lot of these things are done. Uh, no, actually we were not subject to the same restrictions of the general plan and when okay. it can go, so we can take them whenever. Okay. So w w your, your comments are duly noted and we're on board with that, so we okay. will explore as, and as ways to expeditionally just complete give them this. the property dress. So yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's already on, it should be coming to the calendar, so. Uh, so eight, on, on ADUs, it's, so I've actually had uh, owners of fourplexes. Uh, you're saying that, they're, that we're going to allow ADUs to be um, allowed on multifamily dwelling units. When in fact, over the last two years, I've been telling people, no, you can't do it. And now, now I can go back to tell those same people that have wanted to build additional structures, yes, you can. Yeah, th that's state law, so we need to update our ordinance to, to be consistent with state law to facilitate that, but that was the state law that was passed. I believe it was a le legislator from San Francisco, um, was it Berkeley, San Francisco? Uh, um, yes, that's correct. Okay, so let's say that it's a fourplex and they have a patch of grass in the back. They can stick an ADU there? Yes, and I think they could even, correct me if I'm wrong, Martina, convert a carport is what the, the law was okay. saying. Convert a carport to an ADU so or I'll a laundry room. I'll actually have my staff call <laughs> some of the people who've requested that uh, <laughs> to let them know it's possible again. And there would, there would still be some you know, minimum development standards uh, that they would need to meet, but, but on, uh, conceptually, yes, they would they'd be able to add an ADU. Yeah, I, I, I know. I'll, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll get back to that. Okay, does anybody else have questions? Hey, Councilmember Perales. Thank you. So you did make mention of some of the uh, statewide legislation that is, you know, uh, causing some some impacts for us. Namely, you talked about the urban village um, amenities. You you glazed over it as if it. I guess it was a little bit less impactful than I think it's going to be. I don't know if you can go back to that slide and talk a little bit about um, maybe even timing at least on when we think we'll, we will come back to, to have this discussion at the council. Um, and then also I'm curious if Sorry. in our general plan review, um, if we're going to be taking into account uh, some of these statewide, some of the statewide legislation, for instance, the uh, Assembly Bill 3194 talks about um, obviously what's what's within your general plan um, and then uh, not necessarily needing what we're doing right now, which is to change the zoning um, in regards to, you know, so long as it's consistent, right, with your with your general plan. Um, and so it just, I'm just curious, right, uh, uh, how much of what's just passed at the, at the state and from last right. year are we incorporating in the general plan? And then the first question was the urban village one. Yeah, so kind of stepping back a little bit, so our urban village implementation framework that, that council adopted a year and a half ago, sort of the hook on that was that when a developer seeks a rezoning from council to convert a commercial piece of property to a mixed use zoning district, that was sort of the hook in which the council could ask or require amenities to be provided. And AB 1333 is the sort of one color on the map law change which says now it's charter cities like us have to have the zoning consistent with the general plan. And then AB 3194 says that in cases where that is not yet consistent, the cities cannot require um, a developer, a housing developer to rezone consistent to the general plan. So essentially that hook has been taken away. So um, what we're doing now is, is again, we're looking about, and where the state is going is about, uh, if you want to 
if you want to impose anything on housing, it has to be objective, quantifiable standards. So we're looking at creating objective, quantifiable amenity standards that would be embedded in the zoning code. Right now, we're, we're, we're anticipating bringing the, those zoning districts back to council in, in, in June of um, next year. Um, we're, we're hopeful that we can bring uh, the amenities 2.0 embedded in that as well in those zoning districts. We're still sort of kind of getting our head around that, but our plan, at least at this point, is to bring that whole package back in June. It may take a little longer. We're still kind of digging into sort of some other ideas, but that's, that's where we are at this point. Regarding the for you review of the general plan, we have to take into consideration all these state law changes. So. Um, it will, I think, it, or it could impact some of the, the approaches that we're, we're thinking about um, and bringing to the task force, but we, we, we have to. We'd be sort of failing in our duties if we didn't um, consider them as we bring forward recommendations to both the task force and the council. Okay. Uh, to get your, your words correct, did you say uh, objective and quantifiable is what the that, um, Correct. So amenities would have to fall under. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as an example, an SB. Well, we're going to get into this a lot more, so I'm a little reluctant to go too far into it. But an example is SB 330 talks about you can only enforce objectable and quantifiable standards in housing development. So that's actually another work item is causing us to just think about our sort of design guidelines and how we use those and kind of focusing more on standards. We can have guidelines as well sort of in, to inform development of what the city is seeking and help the development to get to a, a, a better project. But in terms of actually being able to force and recommend denial on a project, you're really limited to design standards. This is another example. Is there a, I guess, a, a good definition somewhere out there then on what is fall, what would fall under objective and quantifiable and how we can actually Maybe do some free homework to look into that myself. Yeah, I th I th we could well, we can provide those. But I think a good example um, would be, for example, the form-based zoning district in Alum Rock, where it has it has specific quantifiable requirements in terms of that in that affect the design of a project. Or it could be um, in, in terms of amenity that a project will provide. Um, let's say popos um, at X square footage relate, you know, at this this size level. You know, if you're a project of this size, you'll provide a minimum of this level. Our approach right now, though, is to try to figure out how to have things that you need to do or must do in the zoning districts, while at the same time allowing flexibility, because it's not always one size fits all, and not every every amenity makes sense for all development. So it could be the case, for example, that you have, we have five amenities to choose from and you need to hit three of the five or something like that, as an example. I, I think if you look at the legislation, and I know that our staff has been working and we're planning to try to come up with a memo that explains all the legislation, but mm -hmm. the legislation basically is the state telling local jurisdictions you don't have the, the discretion that you used to have in order to try to hold up projects. Um, and now they have to be objective so that when a developer comes in, he or she knows exactly what is going to be required and does not have to wait for the project to go to before the legislative body where they, where at that point they start asking for different things. It, it, it wa they want to be able to move these projects forward. Um, and I believe when the planning department and CEO comes back with the memo, they will describe to you the type of project that you no longer have the discretion. Um, and now you will have the objective standards so that everyone knows exactly when they apply what those standards are. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, without sort of cutting to the chase here, but it's going to be a very, I think, a pretty different world for us in terms of how we do business. And so I think we'll, we'll be coming back to you to sort of, once we understand our new world, <laughs> we'll be sharing that new world with you. I think just it was can really... I, can I pause you right there yeah, for a yeah. second? Part of the reason why I asked the question around the general plan task force was because I see more value, right, in what our general plan is now, given these state laws, mm -hmm. um, than even what we had previously. To your point, there were triggers or, you know, within the urban village, you know, process, uh, changing the zoning was a trigger point and we could right. use that. We can't anymore. Right. And so, in my mind, it puts so much now emphasis on what we actually have in the general plan and importance in regards to how we are, you know, 
planning out the city in the general plan, if that's where, if that's going to be the document that right individuals really just have to rely on, and there's none, and we're 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 sort of minimizing the other triggers that we would have. Um, so for me, that's where I really we're, we happen to be in this unique position, right? We we are undergoing an update to the general plan with this new task force, but at the same time, to your point, you just said there's not even a full understanding from city staff on what some of these state laws are, are going to change, how they're going to change our world. So I, I want to ensure, right, that that is done before we complete this general plan update. And if the timing there is not lined up, then I would like to elongate the time, right, of the general plan update to allow that body to, you know, provide feedback and allow us to make an update that actually is reflective of all of these. So that's really kind of okay. what I'm getting to. And, and I still don't have necessarily, I guess, a good answer in regards to when you're coming back with a presentation to the council on a good understanding. Um, and then, you know, is that going to line up with our general plan uh, update? But at least, I guess, to yourself, Kim, right, it would be, let's just make that happen, right? Sure. Like if whenever this, we, we need to get this done in this understanding from staff. Staff needs to present that to the council, and then I think that needs to be presented to the task force, and, and it needs to be lined up with whatever decision we make, whatever changes we make to the general plan, considering I think it's... it's sure, so I, just one, one point of clarification, and that is most of the state laws really generally are not about our general plan. Our general plan is pretty solid in terms of housing. It's really what it's more about is the zoning code and our ordinance and our processes. That's where the laws are really focused on. They want us to implement our general plan in a faster, more streamlined way. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why I'm saying there's more so. of an importance now on the general plan itself because, right, we're, we're sort of, that's the, as it always has been, but that's the sort of final document, yeah. regardless if your zoning is even aligned with it or not, right, that like yeah. 3194 is saying, right, it, uh, that's what they're deferring to. Yeah. So, um, okay. Okay. That, that's all my questions. Thank you. Councilmember Diep. Yeah, I, I mean, listening to all this, I, I'm, I'm excited. Without actually passing any judgment on what objective standards will be put into place, I kind of think the development by right is, is a good way to go, um, especially if we want to be consistent and, and actually have a real chance at achieving whatever goal the city, the city sets out for ourselves. And I think, you know, was it Seattle has this sort of process where plan even bypasses the council. Um, but I, I really only wanted to raise a question because of what you said, Michael, earlier about um, Alum Rock being perhaps a kind of good example of what we should be doing. I'm only asking this because I remember a, a few council meetings ago, and this is kind of a, a hat tip to our eagle eye council watchers. Uh, one public commenter came up and made a big to do about um, you look at, I don't know, Barry S. or you look at um, West San Jose General Plan, and they're like really thick and like hundreds of pages long, and then you have Alum Rock, and it's only like five pages. Like, what the heck, man? Like, nobody cares about Alum Rock. So I just kind of want to draw that distinction. Like, can you explain that and why you're holding that up as? Yeah, I mean, I think th there isn't a traditional um, uh, urban village plan for Alum Rock. That, that's true and, and fair enough, and there's a whole story on that which I can share if you'd like. But. Um, I think what I'm talking about, the, the, where we're going with, I mean, not that there can't be a, a, a plan for Alum Rock. I, we will, there, I anticipate there will be a plan for Alum Rock. It's more that where we have to go now to implement and streamline housing development in urban villages to create a zoning district that allows developers to move very quickly the process, either go to director's hearing or planning commission. Um, and so that's the way that was set up five, six, seven, eight years ago in, Al in, in Alum Rock, and that's kind of the approach that we're really gonna move towards in all urban villages. So it's, it's kind of separate from the, the village plan. Yes, there's, there can be urban village plans, there should be urban village plan, but to implement those plans, you need a zoning framework, and the zoning framework that's kind of a model, that the only model that we have at this time is really that Alum Rock form-based zoning district. May I just add, I mean, the, the beauty and the challenge of the urban village plans was the community very clearly articulated what they wanted to see in terms of amenities, infrastructure, streetscape that goes above and beyond our base level requirements. So that, that's a source of um, concern now. How do we not just deliver, you know, projects, but how do we deliver amenities and stick with the whole village concept? So that's why we're going to have to bake in more of those requirements into the zoning code, whereas what we had worked on for several years was like a percentage of the value 
um, when we were rezoning from commercial to mixed use residential, we were going to capture back a percentage of that value and have some flexibility about how that was directed to either pay for or create certain amenities and infrastructure. So the concept of the village is still very much um, central and wanting to meet the resident's goal for the village, but we're going to have to do it via the zoning code because our hands are now tied in terms of the mechanism for delivering the amenities and infrastructure. And I mean, I, I want to delve into this rabbit hole, but I guess to that point, my understanding, because this predates me, but my understanding is the bargain of the previous general plan was basically we have to grow as a city, but we want to keep our kind of suburban San Jose feel. Um, and so let's densify, but only in these designated urban villages. Mm. Uh, that's correct. And, and I, I don't know if that's feasible moving forward with all that's changing around us, but I just, I'll just put that out there for, as, a, as a kind of a, a threat to pull on later. <laughs> Well, I mean, that, that issue is actually being, yeah. it's part of the scope of the four-year review. So that's what we're calling opportunity housing, sometimes right. known as missing middle. But it's sort of, I guess, kind of revisiting what was the grand bargain between don't touch, preserve all single-family neighborhoods, let's just grow by converting our commercial transit corridors into urban villages. And this is kind of taking a first step at exploring, well, could there be places that you, single-family neighborhoods, that you could allow some identification in those areas? That's the first step towards, I think, what you're describing. All right, well, thank you all colleagues for your questions. Move to accept the report. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to item number four, the City Council Policy Priority Number 19, Citywide Design Guidelines Update. Manager in uh, Development Review, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Can I'm you pull up you the microphone update. a little closer to your oh, sorry. mouth? Sorry. Oh, they move around. Okay. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Do I need to turn it on? Nope. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tim Rood, Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement, uh, here to give you an update on Council Priority Number 19, uh, Citywide Design Guidelines and Standards. So as you know, the, the urban design standards and guidelines are um, a set of design principles for development that are used by project applicants in order to uh, design their projects in a way that staff can approve. And they are also used by my colleagues uh, in the implementation side of planning to review projects as they come in for entitlements. So the aim of the uh, guidelines and standards is to reinforce our existing general plan and other policies, goals and values, to promote design excellence and compatibility, to improve the process for everyone and increase predictability, um, and to address how buildings uh, affect and support the character of existing neighborhoods, and finally to reflect contemporary best practices for development. So the council made this a priority back in 2017. Um, we also have policies in the general plan that uh, required the city to periodically review and update its design guidelines. And the guidelines uh, for citywide residential, commercial, and industrial development are very old, uh, some dating back um, almost 30 years. Uh, staff sought and obtained a priority development area staffing grant from ABAG MTC. Uh, this is a different type of grant than a typical financial grant. It actually provides in-kind consultant assistance. So the consultants are paid directly by MTC and the city gets the benefit and is able to direct that work. Uh, so we received a $200,000 in-kind staffing grant last year and the consultants working on this project are an architecture firm, Van Meter Williams Pollock, um, and a planning firm, Urban Planning Partners. So the new citywide guidelines and standards will be a unified document that will fully replace the 97, uh, 1997 residential design guidelines, the 1990 commercial design guidelines, and the 1992 industrial design guidelines. And they will apply throughout the city 
excluding certain areas that have their own guidelines. Uh, you're all familiar with the downtown Diridon guidelines that the council adopted uh, earlier this year. Also, urban villages uh, to date have had their own distinct design guidelines. So any urban village plans that the council has approved prior to the effective date of the new citywide guidelines will, uh, those urban village guidelines and standards will continue to apply. Uh, North San Jose has its own fairly recent set of guidelines. Uh, Barrio Sabart Urban Village is having guidelines developed as part of the urban village process. Uh, approved specific plans will not be subject to these guidelines and also uh, single family homes which planning has a fairly limited role in reviewing. So again, the goals of this update process are to increase uh, consistency and predictability for applicants by making clear what the city's expectations are. Uh, we're also uh, aiming for greater responsiveness to current and anticipated building types. Data centers, for example, are something that our current uh, guidelines from the 90s don't really contemplate. Um, and we're looking for better outcomes. We're looking for higher quality architecture and an improved public realm to support the general plan policies for vibrant neighborhoods and community design. In terms of community engagement, um, we kind of modeling the process that we used successfully for the downtown guidelines. Uh, we began with a community listening session on October 15th uh, over at the MLK Library. Uh, we are holding focus groups with design professionals, developers, and nonprofit organizations. We're aiming to have planning commission study sessions in January and March where we'll be able to walk them through the new guidelines in detail and take their questions. Um, and also historic landmarks commission study sessions in January and March. We are planning a second community workshop after the public release of a draft set of guidelines in January. And we are aiming to complete this council priority uh, by bringing the document to the Planning Commission and City Council uh, before the end of this fiscal year. And we have a dedicated uh, website set up for the effort. This effort is being run uh, by the city design team, which I manage uh, now in the implementation division of planning. A few highlights from what we heard at the October 15th meeting. Um, there was a desire for development to be green in both senses of the word, both uh, sustainable but also uh, vibrant and with a connection to nature. There was a desire to have places for people, family-friendly and uh, child-friendly activities and restaurants and places that contribute to the public realm. Uh, places like farmers markets where neighbors can come together. Uh, ease of orientation and, and flow and access uh, through features such as traffic calming and small blocks and overall attention uh, throughout to bicycles, pedestrians and transit uh, and how development can be designed and oriented to support those alternative modes. Uh, we also heard a desire for art elements in private development, uh, something that's not currently contemplated in our ordinance uh, but is nevertheless encouraged. And uh, we also heard that because this is a citywide document that certain neighborhood groups might be interested in hearing from us. So we're, we're kind of preparing a, a road show uh, to go out and uh, present to neighborhood groups um, as desired. So a quick overview of the structure of the document, um, kind of similar to the downtown design guidelines, it's organized with several broad chapters that track with the typical uh, project design uh, process. So chapter one is kind of the operating system, how to use the document, where it applies, um, and some values and guiding principles that are being derived with input from previous plans as well as from the community. And I won't go through all of these, but they're organized again into broad categories, uh, design, people, places, and policy. So for each page of the document, we're kind of tying back to one or more of these values and guiding principles just to make it clear why we're saying the things that we're saying. Chapter two of the document is all about the site. So that's the arrangement of uses on the site. Where is parking accessed? Where are the front doors? How does the, um, you know, features like uh, you know, necessary back of house, uh, trash enclosures, and all those sorts of different elements of a uh, construction project, how do those get accommodated on the site in a way that uh, contributes to the public realm? Uh, chapter three talks about the three-dimensional architecture of the building, so including the massing at the upper and lower levels and the design of facades. 
And again, similar to the downtown guidelines, uh, there's an entire chapter focused on the public realm, roughly the lowest 20 feet of the building. So the interaction between the development and adjacent public space, sidewalks, paseos, open space. And again, uh, similar to downtown, uh, the, at the goal is to have a very clear structure and organization where essentially each page of the document deals with a different topic. Um, so, and there, there are various parts that repeat in the same format uh, for each of these different topics, including a value statement here, you know, keep people safe, a guiding principle that sort of encapsulates in one sentence uh, what this guideline is all about and what the overarching goal is, rationale, uh, which is an explanation of why this guideline or standard is, why this topic is important, and then guidelines, which are um, typically qualitative and provide guidance for best practices in building design, as well as objective and quantifiable standards, which are, uh, again, designed to uh, help prepare us for these new state mandates and to provide clarity about uh, which elements are required and uh, are verifiable quantifiably. There's also a section on uh, references to related sections of the document, as well as references to applicable general plan policies. So again, every page of the document or every topic uh, follows this same format uh, for clarity and ease of use. And an additional section that's new for the citywide guidelines is a uh, specific development types section. So this takes some common development types, be they data centers or hotels and motels, and uh, provides more detail about how the guidelines and standards can be applied to those particular development types and some of the uh, specific characteristics that they might have. For example, hotels often have a port coast share where you pull up and double park your car for a minute while you run in a register. So we, in that section, we'll have guidelines about how to address that specific type of hotel feature. And this concludes staff's presentation and we'd be happy to I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you for the presentation. I uh, appreciate um, your work on this. Um, once this, these guidelines are done, are you, you outreaching to developers as well? Yes. Uh, we made an announcement at the Developers Roundtable on October 4th that this process was happening and began you know, taking names of interested parties. And as soon as we have a public review draft of the document, we're anticipating holding several focus groups for uh, developers and design professionals, as we did last time. Thank you. One of the complaints that I get occasionally from developers is that uh, not necessarily around the codes and what have you, but around the inspection process itself. One, one inspector would come in and say, you know, this is okay. And then the next one would come in and say, hey, you know what, you didn't take this up to, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the code. The, well, they, they have different interpretations of the code, if oh. you will. Okay. Are we doing anything to streamline the comments from building inspectors? Well, that's not really within the purview of the uh, development review process. Uh, the building inspectors are handled out of the building division, so they're primarily enforcing the building code. Yeah. And, and these guidelines are really to get projects through planning approval. Faster. Okay. No, I appreciate that. We do need, yes, the clearer we could be, the better <laughs> it is for everyone. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Any questions from my colleagues? I'll entertain a motion. I'll move approval. Second. Okay. Well, thank you for your work. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know what? This is actually our last item, huh? Yeah. Record time. Yeah, record time. Okay. I don't see any uh, public comments, and uh, so this meeting is adjourned.